London dispersion forces are forces of attraction that can operate between all atoms and molecules. These forces are much weaker than all other types of bonding. I'm going to use two helium atoms with two outer electrons, shown by ring magnets, to demonstrate to you how London dispersion forces arise. Now, typically in a helium atom, you will have two outer electrons, which will repel each other at opposite sides of the atom. However, because electrons can move around, bear in mind they still repel each other. You can sometimes get this occurring when the electrons move to one side of the atom. This movement of electrons to one side of an atom will generate a negative charge, a delta negative charge at one side of the atom, resulting in a positive charge at the other side of the atom. This difference in charge, and because it happens only at an instant, is referred to as a temporary dipole. Now, one thing to note is that the electrons are negatively charged and will repel each other when they come in the vicinity of each other. So if we have a neighbouring helium atom, this negative charge generated by the temporary dipole will repel these electrons to this side of the helium atom. generating a delta negative charge at this side of the atom and a delta positive charge at this side of the atom. Because this dipole has been caused or induced by a neighbouring atom, we call this an induced dipole. Now you can see now we have an electrostatic attraction between the two atoms. And this electrostatic attraction between the two atoms caused by a temporary dipole and an induced dipole, we refer to as a London dispersion force. Sometimes abbreviated to LD. F. So to summarise then, London dispersion forces are formed as a result of the electrostatic attraction between temporary dipoles and induced dipoles caused by the movement of electrons in atoms and molecules. London dispersion forces can be used to help explain the trends in boiling points of the noble gases as you go down group zero. If we go down from helium to krypton, we can see that the boiling point for these elements increases as you go down the group. To help explain this, we need to calculate the total number of electrons present in each atom. So helium has two, neon has 10, argon has 18, and krypton as 36. So as you go down the group from helium to krypton, the number of electrons increases. How does this explain the increase in boiling point? Well, we need to look at the London dispersion forces. Remember, these are caused by movement of electrons. The more electrons which are present in an atom, the stronger the London dispersion forces will be between the atoms. Because neon has 10 electrons, and helium has only got two electrons, the London dispersion forces will be stronger between the neon atoms. Therefore, more energy will be required to overcome these London dispersion forces and melt and boil neon compared to helium. So to summarize, the more electrons that are present in an atom, the stronger the London dispersion forces, and therefore the higher the melting and boiling point will be for that element. As you go down group seven, you can see that the trend for the halogens going down the group is similar to the trend in terms of boiling point with the noble gases. And that as you go down the group, the boiling point increases. And again, the reason is because the number of electrons in the molecule increases as you go down a group. This time, however, 
we're talking about the number of electrons in the molecule rather than the atom. Because remember, the, to fill their energy levels, the halogens pair up as diatomic molecules. So the reason I've calculated 18 for this is because each fluorine atom had the electron arrangement 27 before it paired up to form the diatomic molecule. The more electrons you have in the molecule, that means you've got stronger London dispersion forces between the molecule, not between the atoms. We have covalent bonds between the atoms. So as the atom size and the molecule size increases and the number of electrons increases, we get a higher boiling point because we've got stronger LDFs. Now, to show this a bit more visually, I'm going to compare fluorine and iodine. So if you look at fluorine here, fluorine has a lower boiling point because the London dispersion forces between the molecules are weaker than the London dispersion forces between the iodine molecules because the iodine atoms in the iodine molecules have more electrons and therefore the stronger LDFs present. One thing to note is when we're melting and boiling molecules such as the halogens, we're breaking the weak forces between the molecules. We're not breaking these very strong covalent bonds between the atoms. Okay, So when we're melting covalent molecular substances, we're overcoming the weak LDFs between the molecules. We're not breaking strong covalent bonds. So to summarize, the more electrons you have in a molecule, the higher the boiling point, because there are stronger London dispersion forces between the molecules to be overcome. Here's a quick test for you. Out of the first 20 elements, I want to list the ones that exist in a covalent molecular form as a gas and in a covalent molecular form as a solid, not a covalent network form. So pause it, write them down and then see if you get what I get. Okay, so the elements that exist as a gas at room temperature out of the first 20 are hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine and chlorine. The elements that, that are covalent molecular that exist as solids at room temperature are phosphorus, sulfur and carbon in the form of fullerene. Not graphite or diamond, they're network elements, even though they're solids at room temperature. So why do these elements exist as solids? And these ones exist as gases. Well, let's look at the number of atoms in the molecule. Hydrogen is diatomic. Nitrogen is also diatomic with a triple bond between the atoms. Oxygen is diatomic. Fluorine is a diatomic gas. Chlorine is also a diatomic gas as well. So these all have two atoms in the molecule. Phosphorus, however, has four atoms in its molecule, forming a sort of tetrahedral shape like this. Sulfur has eight atoms in its molecule, having a structure like this. And one of the fullerenes typically will have 60 atoms in its molecule with a shape like this. So you can conclude at this stage that the elements that exist as a solid root solid at room temperature have more atoms in their molecules compared to the diatomic gases which only have two atoms in the molecule. So why does phosphorus have a higher boiling point than chlorine? Well the higher boiling point of phosphorus tells us that more energy is required to separate the phosphorus molecules than with the chlorine molecules. Notice that we're just separating the molecules and breaking the weak into molecular forces between the molecules. We're not breaking these strong covalent bonds. So what this tells us is that the London dispersion forces 
between the phosphorus molecules are a lot stronger than the London dispersion forces. between the fluorine molecules. And the reason is this is due to the number of electrons in each molecule. If you look at the electron arrangement for chlorine, it's 2A7. So there are 17 electrons in a chlorine atom. If we look at the electron arrangement for phosphorus, it is 2A5. So there are 15 electrons in a phosphorus atom. Now this may seem confusing because some people might think this suggests that the chlorine, because it has more electrons in it, will have a stronger London dispersion force, uh, stronger London dispersion forces than that of a phosphorus atom. But the thing to note is that there are two chlorine atoms in a molecule. So the number of electrons it's going to be 2 times 17, 2 times 17, which gives you 34 electrons in total in a Cl molecule. In a phosphorus molecule, however, there are four atoms. So the total number of electrons is going to be 4 times 15, which is going to give you 60 electrons. in that phosphorus molecule. So because the phosphorus molecule has 60 electrons in this molecule and the chlorine molecule has 34 electrons in this molecule, the phosphorus molecule will have stronger London dispersion forces between its molecule. Therefore, more energy is required to overcome those London dispersion forces. Therefore, it will have a higher melting and boiling point and it will be more likely to be a solid at room temperature. So it should become apparent that the reason why sulphur and fullerenes are solid at room temperature is due to the fact they are comparatively large molecules compared to, say, the diatomic elements. So sulphur having eight atoms as molecule will have 128 electrons, which in turn will give it comparatively stronger London dispersion forces to overcome when you're trying to boil or melt sulphur. And the same goes for fullerene too, is that we have to overcome these comparatively strong LDFs between the C60 molecules, the fullerenes, when we're melting or boiling. We're not breaking the strong covalent bonds within the molecule of either sulfur or fullerenes. We've only looked at London dispersion forces in elements so far. But the similar trend can be seen in compounds as well. So let's take, for example, three compounds, in this case, the first three alkanes, methane, ethane and propane. If we look at the boiling points, we can see that as you go from methane to ethane to propane, as the molecule gets bigger, the boiling point increases. As well as the molecule getting bigger, we're going to have more atoms, therefore more electrons. So for instance, if we look at methane, that carbon is going to have six electrons. Each of those hydrogen atoms will have one electron. So the number of electrons in the molecule is 10. If we do the calculations, this one's 18. And this one is 26 electrons. So you can see that as the number of electrons in the molecule increases, the boiling point increases. And the reason for that is the strength of the London dispersion forces increases as well. So the same rules that apply to elements in terms of London dispersion forces, i.e. bigger molecules, more electrons, more London dispersion forces to overcome, apply to compounds as well as elements. So this is a summary of everything we've covered. Things to note that LDFs, London Dispersion Forces, operate between all atoms and molecules. We're not talking about ions, which would be present ionic lattices, metallic lattices, and so on. We're generally talking about non-metal elements here. Um, these are the weakest force that you will come across in the higher chemistry course. These are 
a lot weaker than covalent ionic and metallic bonds, and out of the van der Waals forces, such as hydrogen bonds, permanent dipole interactions, and so on, these are the weakest ones you'll come across. Sometimes you'll be asked to describe how London dispersion forces arise, and the words they're kind of looking for are temporary dipoles, they're not permanent dipoles, they're temporary, and they're caused by the movement of electrons in atoms. The thing to note as well that the strength of the London dispersion forces is related to the number of electrons within an atom or molecule, whether it's an element or a compound, and this in turn can have effect on the properties of the element or compound, such as the boiling point or the melting point.